It's a joy to be here with you today and share with you. And the show, uh, if we are ready to begin, I'll start with a prayer and then we'll have a little discourse here and then we stay for some questions and answers and go forward from there. So thank you. So let us begin. Let's begin with a prayer. Invite the Masters, Divine Mother, her presence to be felt within our hearts. Heavenly Father, Divine Mother, friend, beloved God, great masters of self-realization, Jesus Christ, Babaji Krishna, Lahiri Mahashai, Swami, Sri Yukteswar, beloved Gurudev, Paramahansa Yogananda, saints of all religion, we bow to you all. Divine Mother, make us channels for thy inspiration, thy joy, thy peace, and thy love to all. We are thy servants. May we serve thee ever more perfectly in all that we do. Om Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. The, uh, uh, you know, the topic today is uh, how to worship more perfectly uh, or something along those lines. <laughs> but it's interesting that, uh, you know, doing Sunday satsangs or really any discourse, but particularly I find this true for Sunday. I, if I know I'm going to be doing that uh, function on a coming Sunday, I, I always look up the topic, remember what's the topic, and I start thinking about the topic during the week ahead of time. You know, not so much trying to arrange a, a, a discourse or anything like that, but just the topic itself, tune into that topic. And it's interesting, when you tune into a certain topic, whatever it might be, you st it's like putting a filter on your self, on your glasses, if you were, you know, but you see, you start seeing life through that filter. And I, I find it almost inevitable. Then you start seeing life through that filter pretty soon, you know, uh, it, uh, your thoughts are in tuned in that you start to attune to that topping. So this week I was, I was how to worship, you know, more perfectly God. And I began to think about that because it's a good, I mean, Good thing to ask. What do, how can I do this more perfectly? And then I began to think, what in the world is worship anyway? What is that word? It's kind of a, in my mind, it sort of has a little harshness to it. I'm not quite sure whether that's cultural upbringing or what, but the idea of worshiping is, uh, uh, I thought, what is that? So I looked it up in the dictionary and it's in a basically it, it's, uh, in the, I, as I kind of suspect, it's, it's giving reverence. Is it's sort of a simple way to put it. It can be more things than that, of course, too. But it's giving reverence. And that, I like that word, you know, because uh, uh, it's, it, it's like today's reading on kindness, if you did the affirmation. It, kindness is, uh, in giving kindness, you receive kindness. And, and it's in its, its own reward, you might say. It's in the same thing. I think reverence is, in, is its own reward because you start to see life and you start to recognize, well, oh, this is such a beautiful world. So everything is, you just sort of revere things and you begin to feel that sense of reverence, that deep respect or veneration toward life in general. And, and just by giving it respect, you somehow bring that out. You bring those qualities out. And I think this is why people, of course, we go to church on satsangs on Sunday and, you know, we give reverence. Now, of course, you know, it's always praise the Lord, you know, you could say, but, you know, God doesn't really want our praise. I mean, it, that's not so much what worship is. It could be because, you know, as Master used to say, God doesn't need our praises. What God really needs, or not doesn't need, but God, what, what God wants is what's most pleasing, of course, is God wants our love. But when we begin to see, uh, in, in sort of to give reverence, show, or to even show reverence, take it one step further, to show reverence to the world around us, God's creation, and even take it one step further, who is behind this creation, it starts to bring something out. And in that spirit, the last couple of days, on I, I'm uh, doing this broadcast not from home, but from uh, our recording studio at where our, my office is in this area. And uh, 
Uh, I walk here every day, and I think on my walk back and forth, there's a at this time of year the wildflowers are out. And I imagine Dallas area, Texas, the wildflowers are out too this time of year, and it's just so beautiful. There, I go through a patch. You know, there's a couple of different patches. They're looping in one spot, and there's all these California, beautiful California poppies in another spot, and a whole bunch of these, I don't know what they are, they're little tiny white flower, like a carpet. And I look and I said, oh, that's so beautiful. That's so beautiful. And I stop because I'm, you know, I'm here, you know, we're doing reverence this week and or worship. And I just try to attune myself with that beauty there, that beauty within or without, outside, and I try to feel within. And, but I noticed something, and this goes to worship, to, uh, going to church, to revere. There's a sense, in a sense, I want to be that it's so beautiful. Things are so beautiful, but it's I'm observing it. I'm outside of that beauty. I don't know if you've ever had that feeling, that, that feeling that you're not quite uh, connected you're, but you're outside and you just want to get inside that beauty, lose yourself in that beauty. And I think the word probably is you want to commune with that. And I realized our approach to the divine, to divine mother, to those things we revere in life, we give them honor, we give them appreciation, we do give reverence to them, which is the mark, I think, of a sensitive person, a devotee should be this way. And it's the beginning point. That beginning point of worshiping, you might say, with prayer, with our attitudes. But it's also a certain sense of, it can also have a little bit of a, it awakens this sense that somehow we're outside. In other words, we're, it's, I'm separate from God. It, it reminds me of my separation from God. And in some way, on a very subtle level, I, this sounds a little bit odd, but I, I somehow, it hurts. <laughs> it's so beautiful sometimes that it hurts because I'm not one with it. And what I really, I think what we really want and what I want is I want to take it that next step. I want to commune with it. I want to commune with that beauty. I want to commune with not to, the beauty, of course, is representation of God's creations. It's God who's behind that beauty. I want to commune with it. And that, in that sense of separation, I think it's a good thing. That little bit of feeling of, oh my gosh, I'm not in that water. I'm not swimming in it because it spurs us on. And so I think it's a good step. And I think in, in terms of life in general, I think it's we as an individual, it's very helpful to us to be reverent, to practice actually reverence, which is like saying maybe like appreciation, practice being appreciative. And I think it's something we should teach our children also to be appreciative, uh, to be respectful, and to take it, you might say that uh, uh, to that well, next step, which is to be reverent and to almost you could say, to worship in a way is in, in the because worship is the showing of reverence to that which inspires us, that which uplifts us. And so if there's an instrument in this world that uplifts us, for example, the guru, we we there's a, we show that reverence to that. And I think it's a mark of a more refined soul to do that. But I also think just rather than just being a mark, I think it actually is something as a practice. And I would think also as a society, you know, sometimes we don't show much reverence, you know, nature. I mean, people are getting into the more habit now of being a little bit more reverent toward our natural world around us. But of those things that are exalted, now there's sometimes there's even this tendency, oh, you know, because it does, we don't like to pay respect to something that's exalted because we feel it somehow diminishes us. You know, the, the ego doesn't like to do that. Oh, that person is a, a great soul, but yes, but, or whatever, you could fill in the blanks. We tend to sometimes want to pull things down to our own level, which is not a good thing. It's not a healthy thing. I remember in India, there uh, Swami Kriyananda, where I, I do serve uh, uh, 
also, yeah, I'm in America right now, but uh, I do also go to India. And I remember Swami making reference a little bit along the lines of this, uh, this topic, but a certain sweetness that he noticed in, he, in there, and because people are very reverent into all in in two devotional things and they expressed their devotional he was making mention to there was one lady he knew that uh, she would listen and this is some years ago and people would listen to the radio you remember that radio <laughs> those are the thing <laughs> we used to have and she would uh listen to spiritual programs uh, uh that were you know like in america there's uh, Sunday, you'll find on the radio, you know, worship services and so on. And same thing in India, they would tune into satsangs. And she would bow to the radio and she would place a garland on the radio. <laughs> I mean, it's like, the, like you place a garland on the flower, you place, she would place it on the radio. And Swami noticed that and she thought that he thought that was so sweet. You know? And it was, a gesture, you might say. Now, some people might make fun of that. You know, somebody a little bit worldly conscious make fun of that. But it was actually quite sweet. And there was something, uh, because I do serve in India, something I do like about India is that you do see, you see this sort of outward expression of reverence in a very respectful, sweet way. And you see also, you'll see these shrines and temples uh, everywhere, all, in all sorts of different reasons. There's there might be a special tree or a special rock or a special spot somewhere just very obscure. And I sometimes I remember there was it's uh, there's a street in one section of Pune where I stay. And it's a very busy street and going right down the center street. They rebuilt they, they rehabilitated, made, made it more modern. But right in the very center of that of that busy, there's a, a tree. And because it's a special tree, you know, they, they, they interrupted the road and they made, went to great expense and, and, and trouble to go around the tree on both sides. Uh, to be, it was, uh, because that it was a special tree, had a special meaning and meaning. And I was thinking, you know, maybe sometimes we do that in the West, but not nearly to the extent that, uh, People respected that there was a specialness there. And there was obviously a story behind that, which I don't know what the story was, but it was, that was very common. You see that very commonly. And I was also reminded in this of the, you remember the story of Master, he goes to visit Ram Gopal Muzumdar. And on the way there, there's a, a, a very famous temple, uh, shrine, of. uh, uh, uh uh, Tarakeshwar and in the he goes there and inside he, it's, it's a temple and it's just a stone a very uh, smooth round stone it's in, you might say it's symbolic of the infinite nature of 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 the Lord and master was his, his state of mind was not centered as it perhaps should be should have been and in his mind, the thought went through. He, he, he didn't bow to the stone. He says, God should be sought only within the soul. He was very, you know, austere in that way, not in these outward, you know, uh, superstitious ways, maybe he was thinking. And so, he, and of course, on his journey to try to find Ramakopal Musamdar, he can, gets completely lost. And asking for directions, uh, he was sent in the wrong way, in a very hot at that time of year, probably very humid, and he's exhausted, and he's, and it's just always a crochet more, one more crochet, and he goes another crochet or two. That's a measure of distance, and it's always one more or two more, and, and he never seems to get there until finally, he crosses the path of uh, an elderly gentleman, who is Ram Gopal, who was just on his way to go to another destination and he crossed his path and he says, ah, he's found him. But after great travail and Ram Gopal asks him, uh, he says, when he tells him, he says, he asks Mukunda, the Yogananda as a boy, he says, tell me, Mukunda, where do you think God is? 
And Mukunda says, oh, why, sir? He's, uh, he's within me and he's everywhere. And then Ramagopal says, so then why, young sir, did you fail to bow before the infinite in the stone symbol at Darkshore Temple? And, you know, that, and in a sense, the ignoring of that, you add the implication is this led to all his troubles so that he ended up having, he didn't have the right attitude of reverence. And you see, and he just ignored these things. And I think in the same thing in our own life, day to day, maybe I wouldn't pay reverence to those flowers. That be the beauty, it's not so much the flowers, the flowers, just, but it's the beauty behind, the beauty that's expressed God's beauty. Maybe I wouldn't pay much attention, although I doubt that. I <laughs> they're so beautiful. But there's many things in life where we could give reverence to if we open our eyes, you see, if we take the time to train ourselves, to have our eyes open, to be able to see what's around us and to see it in with, with people's gestures, appreciation, you might say, to be appreciative, it takes a sensitivity to have that attitude toward appreciation, say toward nature and God's creation. It's, it's, appreciation is like, one step below reverence, you then revere it and you give it energy is what's happening here. And the energy that you put out is returned. Life is like that. The energy we put out toward life ends up being reciprocated in some way. And perhaps that was what Ram Gopal was telling Master and why he ended up getting lost. You know, so if you get lost, <laughs> maybe look back. In other words, if you're, if you're, the implication is if you revere and see God within everything around you, maybe things will go well for you. Maybe not. You don't know. You can't make this you know, like superstitious to that extent. But nevertheless, it's its own reward, not for what it brings you. Because in the very act of being appreciative, a very act of being reverent, we gain because the heart is changed. The heart is open, and we come one step closer to communion is what we really want. We want to commune with God. We want to just revere God. We don't want to just sing God's praises. I mean, that's not enough. He doesn't need our praises. What he's looking for is our love. Our re and reverence, you might say, is one step toward that, if we think of it in that way. There was a, there's a story, you know, you've, you probably have on your altar there, uh, a picture of uh, Lahiri Mahashai. And that picture of Lahiri, uh, there was only one photograph of Lahiri that uh, existent that has been passed down. It's been touched up artistically in various forms, but it, could, it derives from one picture because he didn't let photographers take his picture. And if they tried to take his picture, the, the, they wouldn't develop, they wouldn't turn out. And see it, but he did finally allow one picture to be taken of him. And uh, so one of his devotees at that time had a copy of this picture and went to Lahiri Mahashai and said, I've been praying to this picture, does, and I want to know, does this picture have power to it? You know, and because and, people can't take these things just, you know, uh, as talismans, you might say, as amulets uh, for just by nature, do they have power within them? And the leader responded, he says, if you deem it having protection, if you deem it as protection for you, it will be. Otherwise, it's merely a picture. You see, life is what you make of it. You draw, it's what we give into it. We give in to something, we give reverence to something and the world, the devas, however you want, returns it. It's it's the, it it we make it so by the devotion within ourselves. And this is this is uh, you know this is I mean this is commonly under what I was mentioning in India. This is commonly understood there, and so consequently the ideal is you be reverent to everything. I mean you can it goes quite a bit to extremes. God is in everything. And there's a truth to that. And we need to be reminded of that. I, 
I was, uh, uh, and when the doing of that, I think in the doing of that, we feel near and dear. God is near and dear. And that's how we want to take reverence to communion, to feeling that he's our very own. He's loving. He's there. And it's not in the sense of worship, in the sense of praise on the high altar far away. It's loving right here. God is our very own. Yesterday I was at a class in, uh, uh, you know Brahmachari Sagar, he's been there. He was, I think he was there recently in Dallas. He was, he made a, he reminded me in this class of uh, something, and I, which I think, oh, I want to share that. He says, he reminded me of the story of Bakunda when he first met Sri Yuksteshwar, and he asked us, the asked the audience, and he says, what were the first words that Sri Yukteswar said? And if this, uh, you can uh, put it in the chat box if you know the answer. And uh, let's see, anybody going to put it in the chat box? If you know, uh, I don't see any, or do I? No. Anyway, <laughs> anyway, the very first words that Sri Yukteswar said were, uh, uh, were, uh, uh, <laughs> he says, oh, my own, you have come to me. Think of that. Oh, my own, you have come to me. And, you know, Sri Yukteswar, from what we read in the Autobiography, very, a bit of a stern disposition and manner, but with love in his heart, he says, oh, you've come, you've come. And I think this is, the, you know, in a sense, uh, this is what God is saying to us. It said that because we think of God as far away. But really, it said that when somebody awakens to God, God becomes a reality for him. There's great rejoicing in the heavens and the astral worlds. And in a sense, you could say Divine Mother is saying those very words, Oh, my own, you finally come to me. It's how we think God is hiding from us. But it's really not that way at all. It's we are running around and running away from God, seeking everything else, like that wonderful poem, The Hound of Heaven, where it's a, he's, the fellow is is running because something is chasing him, and he's running away because he thinks it's going to devour him or hurt, kill him or hurt him, and, and till he can't run anymore. And he realizes, just as he's exhausted, and that hound, which seems to be chasing him, catches him. And, you know, then it's, he realizes it wasn't for his harm. It was God chasing him all the time. The shade of my hand, he was saying, he, he perceived as the darkness and that dark and the fear that it was merely the shade of his hand, God's hand reaching down to us. And so this is all oh, my own. You've come to me. God is waiting. God wants our love. And we need to, and I think this, of course, is the function of churches and temples is to help us to commune and help us to find God, not, not just to praise God, but to take it to that next step. How do we go beyond merely revering? How do we go beyond praising? And it's to help us to do those things that will bring us into communion with God, to help us to express that God. And of course, we start with awakening that love in our heart, prayer to God, but also beyond prayer, learning also to listen. And that's, of course, meditation, the techniques of self-realization. This is what the Great Ones brought to us is those techniques that we might fulfill that true worship of God with all our hearts, all our mind, all our soul, and all our strength. And that's what, that's the way to worship God with our very heart. And then we find and that God has been waiting all this time. And it's not, God doesn't want us to be distant. It's our own selves, our own habits, our own dispositions that have made it that way. And so I, I want to end with this uh, quote from the very reading that we had probably earlier today. You probably did this reading. I'd like to read this. He says, God is silence. He must be sought, therefore, 
in inner silence. God is absolute love. He must be sought, therefore, in the silence of love. God is spirit and thus immaterial. He must be sought above all in the expanding peace of deep meditation. So this is uh, me from Ananda Village wishing and sending blessings to all of you in Dallas and hoping that take these words, look around, see the world through the eyes of a worshipful attitude, a reverent attitude. I met it, it, it sort of resonated a little bit better with me for that word with a reverent attitude brings about a state of humbleness, uh, a state of appreciation, a state and also brings about a great deal of the heart is open, a sense of thankfulness. And it also, if you're like me, it awakens that desire that I want something more than just this looking at beauty. I want to be that beauty. I want God to be with me and I want to commune with God as that beauty. So God bless all of you today. And uh, I'd like to stay. I've been invited to stay for some questions and answers. And I always enjoy that. And so if you have any questions, I don't know how we're going to do this so verbally or should I put, I got to put my earbuds on here so I can hear you. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're, we uh, will invite anybody. They, they can either come on camera or put it in the chat box. We'll, we'll uh, go, we go off of Facebook now, right? So we tell our Facebook friends that if you want to join us and um, for the satsang, just go to our web page and you can join through Zoom. But we'll we'll say goodbye to our Facebook friends for now, and then we'll open it up for questions from everybody who's yeah, you, yeah, and you can put them. You know, you can put them in the. I, oh, I can even open up my gallery view here, maybe, huh? So you could either, you know, digitally raise your hand or verb, you know, or literally. I can wave it if you do, but uh, or put it in the chat box. And oh, I don't see any faces here. Can I, if you would, it's all I'm looking at gallery view and I see. Now, let's see this. Let's see this. Now, if I was to. If I was to talk to you like this. <laughs> <laughs> how are you doing today in Dallas? I'm, I'm just doing wonderful and it's so good to see all of you. All those black boxes with names in them. <laughs> <laughs> and you know that wouldn't be very great you know so anyway i'm going to put myself back so <laughs> okay did i see a hand go up and missy did you have a hand up i don't know you or... I, I was waving i saw linda waving, oh, so. okay i'll wave back <laughs> But uh, thank you all. Some of you put your, some of you put, and I know sometimes it's not so easy because you're listening in other venue where it's not easy to put your camera on. But <laughs> if it is easy, it's it's nice to. There's a, a Alex in the in the um, chat box says, as with all oh. founders, I would like you, I'd like to know your origin story, where you grew oh, up, how you met, oh. <laughs> what drew you into the spiritual path. Do we have a couple hours? You know, <laughs> <laughs> just a little. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and then I'm, I'm going to read the second one so I can have these in my mind. In a, OK, uh, OK, standing outside the Temple of Light, going inside. Oh, oh, oh somebody is. Who's that? Oh, that's Supriya. Oh, OK. And then she said that I did see Supriya actually yesterday. And uh, so it was nice to see her. Uh, origin story, you know, I I. I met Swami Kriyananda when he lived in San Francisco. There was no Ananda village in those days, but he did purchase this property of the Ananda meditation retreat where some of you may have visited. And it's beautiful. I was up there for a week and I was staying in the dome that Swami, we had constructed at that time for Swami. And that would have been when I got there, it was 1969. We didn't have the property of Ananda village at that time. So I've been around the this work for a long time. And I I had went up there because I had read the autobiography, of course, and uh, and there's the stories behind that. And I had also read I had also met Swami Kriyananda, which also was, you know, interesting coincidence, coincidence, you know, <laughs> and uh, but uh, I met uh, and then I he at that time was living in San Francisco, 19th Avenue. 
and for those of you who know, and San Francisco. And he uh, had a flat there and he'd invite people over for satsangs. I had met him through a class series that he had done in Berkeley, California, where I had been a student. And uh, so when the class series was over, you know, I was very attracted to what he had to offer. And I felt something, you know, I felt something there. I didn't know what it was, but it was magnetic enough to draw me. And he said, well, if you're interested further, why don't you just come to satsangs? We have their meditations on Thursday evenings. And I did. And I went there and I start weekly ones. And it was from that in late 1969 that I became acquainted with him and one or two other early pioneers here. And he uh, in the you know, when you graduate from college, you're at you're in this time of life where, well, I'm done with that. Now what? <laughs> you know, <laughs> what am I do? I didn't have a firm idea of what I wanted to do, although I knew a lot of what I didn't want to do. You know, I, I and that was the you know, this is I think that's probably speaks to many of us. I'm not going to do, you know, I can't I couldn't see myself behind a desk somewhere, you know, <laughs> doing corporate work or I wasn't interested in money or any of that stuff. You know, you're a young person. You what do you want? You want adventure you know you want something new you want to you want to you know, see see the world maybe and it's not some normal stuff and so it, but he had he was he had bought this piece of property uh which is now the ananda meditation retreat and he wanted to have uh country retreats there when summer came in 1969 this would have been at 68 and he wanted in 69 he wanted to have those retreats but it was it bare bones. He needed facilities, you know, there. And there was a couple of fellows up there working. And he said, you know, what are you doing, you know, with your life? What are you doing? And I said, oh, not much. You know, I'm just trying to figure things out. And he said, would you be willing to help me? Now, that was portentous. That's a good question. Would I be willing to help? And it took me about a tenth of a second to say, yes, <laughs> I would, because uh, it kind of, ah, here's something to do and uh, useful. And I wanted to be useful. And I, you know, I felt drawn to Swamiji. And so he says, well, I need some help up there to getting this place ready, you know, to, for spring. And would you be willing to go up there and help? There's a couple of fellows up there already, you know, you could help them. And I thought that was the greatest Thing, you know, the opportunity to get out in the forest, up in the mountain. You know, you have ever have when you're young, you have these visions of I'm a yogi up in the mountains and, you know, and all that rom the romantic ideal of the spiritual path. And it was very strong within me. And so, you know, it's 22. Away I went. And that's how I ended up at Ananda. I ended up staying. But uh, and I didn't necessarily think I was going to stay at the time. I, you know, when you're 22, you don't think far in advance. <laughs> you think maybe next week is, you know, that's a long time and a month. Oh, my God. So but it, as time went by, I ended up staying and there's and so and then, of course, like Maitri said in the introduction, I've done a little of everything over the years and uh, uh, so it's a long story, but I don't want to dwell too much. Here. We have so much time. But anyway, if there's any specific, more a little bit more specific questions, I'd be happy to share with those. Uh, uh, I don't see any. Uh, yeah, there is there is another one. Good to see you, Jaya. Sorry okay. I missed the first part. That's from oh, Shiva. Oh. What aspects help to quickly get to the reverent attitude? Well, of course, you know, I think... And of course, this this is different in different cultures. I think I, I think I've always been a lover of nature. I think many of you probably share that. I always just there was something about it. You know, I used to I remember, you know, reading all of the books by John Muir and just, you know, going up to the mountains and beautiful place. I still enjoy that. And so I in a sense, there's a natural reverence for the for the natural world. And I think many people, I'm sure, share that to such a degree that you can actually make that your, can kind of quote, your religion, nature, sort of a nature religion to, to a degree. And, and, and that's not necessarily, I don't dissuade that, except 
that's the creative. There's something beyond that, of course. I see it as a doorway, a doorway. To, but so in a sense, that was one of the things I was reverent to for the, the beauty of the world around me. But then, of course, I also began to notice something. There's a lot of ugliness, too. <laughs> but, you know, I saw that in the way people behavior, uh, things like that. And then I sort of thought, oh, you know, this is everything's lousy in life. It's people. People's the problem and society's bad. You know, and I, this is me as a student, you know, I, and I became cynical and, and sort of took that side of it, you know, and then and if, if only if only you know, see people would do this or that, I became very, very it was a mark of my idealism, I think. And then you begin to realize that life is like that life. And then I began to study philosophy and philosophy is duality, light and darkness, light. And, and how do we transcend, go beyond life and darkness? And and I began to realize, yes, there is a lot of bad things in this world, but there's also good things as well. It's 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 shades. And then I began to explore the lives of those people who seem to live remarkable lives. I began to be attracted. Now, this is before I read the autobiography and all of that, but I, I began to be attracted to great souls. There are great, there are such a thing, people who, I mean, a, a soul is neither great nor not, a soul just is, but have qualities. You know how we use it colloquially. There are people who are great people. They, they demonstrated in their lives high values and you can go and you can do this in a worldly sense and which you know i've read tons and tons of biographies of you know great people and that's and it's inspiring because you want to be like you want to take on those qualities and so you read a life of somebody and it inspires you to take on those qualities and so that i think admiring and looking into the lives of great souls is a way to inspire ourselves it's re you can be reverential in that way but then you see that some people are more remarkable than others <laughs> and i think these are the saints the great saints throughout history you know you start to think wow is that really true and that was of course what drew me to the autobiography of a yogi or didn't draw me there i didn't know anything about it but i i saw it on the bookshelf and i read it and I said, actually, I had two responses when I read that book. One is, I think, this is crazy. You know, <laughs> see, I was, I mean, put yourself, remember, I, I know nothing about any of this. And I'm 22 years old. I was a student at Berkeley, you know, and so consequently of a certain mindset. And uh, I said, this is nonsense. But then I thought, no, wait a minute, though. I that was my head, you see, my head was saying, I don't think so. You know, all these miracles and I thought, no way. But then I think this was grace of God, really, or <laughs> grace of God. There's another side of us, the heart. I said, yeah, but this person, this author, I feel something here. There's a sincerity. He's either telling the truth of what his personal experience, he's either being absolutely truthful or he's an absolute fraud. It's one or the other. I mean, because there's such a, the difference between those was so stark. It wasn't subtle one way or the other. <laughs> and with that, I had to choose. And I just went with my heart and which was, thank God for that. And because I had been living my whole life through my head and as a spec, particularly as a student, and so it was so so reverentially approaching great souls now we live in a relative world and and you can't it's hard you send you you have to see on below the surface of what's going on and but when you're young you tend to see things more in black and white than when you get older you start to see things a little more subtly and it's not always on the surface you know i'd say dharma is subtle my lord is what a refrain that if you ever read the Mahabharata, Bhishma, the great character there, keeps repeating, it's very subtle. <laughs> but go with your heart, I think. But 
your heart has to be kept in a state of balance. And that's where the reasoning side comes in, you know, so you, you, it's not one or the other. It's, uh, it's, it's both. But nevertheless, Sri Yukteswar said, he said, you're not going to make any progress on the spiritual path until you awaken the natural love of your heart. And then you have to keep it in a state of balance, in a state of reason. But you have to awaken it. You're not going to, without that, you just can't get very far. And that's been my experience. And then that, of course, reverential, being reverent, plays into that because it's a heart quality. It's being appreciative. Oh my gosh. And giving, give, it's a giving, you see. We have to give. And to be reverent is a giving of your heart's feelings of appreciation and, and worship, if you will. And only if you give will you be able to receive because it doesn't, you can't wait to receive first and then you'll give. You have to give first and then you'll receive. And so that's something to keep in mind. You have to serve first and give of yourself first and, you know, project happiness first and project love to somebody. If you want to be loved, you have to love them first. And you have to have project love. So it's a pr basic principle that we all come to learn. Anyway, I'll go on to the next question. Uh, have you been fostering the next generation of oh, inhabitants at Ananda Village with your time spent in the United States? I try to. There's some great souls I met. Well, not to include Sambhava, uh, just Tyler, blah, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, to name the, and, you know, this is one of the things that actually is very much consciously approached. The, my generation, we're going to be gone pretty soon. Hooray. <laughs> I hope, I, I hope in a blissful state, but, uh, but, Yes, we are going to be gone and, and uh, it has is life. It has to pass to the next generation, take up the mantle. Just as it has been passed to each of us, we have to pass what we have learned on to the It's our duty, I think, as souls to do that. And as a group of souls, we have to do that. So it's a very conscious effort. Yes, that is happening. And not only here, and this is actually, now I don't play a role so much in Ananda Village in that regard, because I've, I've basically been mostly in India for the last 16 years. That's time flies. But we are, so I am, I and others in leadership in the Indian side are very consciously doing that in India, passing it on because we're saying, look, we're going to be gone here. How's things going to go? And when we're, you know, we're not here and India, of course, faces its, its very unique challenges because of culturally how people relate there. And so you have to approach these things in, in the cultural context of which you find yourself. And so that's what we're trying to do when we and uh, all and I, I think every Ananda Center, every Ananda work, Dallas needs to be thinking in the same way is you need to be thinking who's next going to take up the mantle and then mentoring people, encouraging them and bringing out the qualities that you feel are, you know, what attracted you? Why, why do you, why have you stayed? What service, you know, and devotion, all of these things and leadership qualities, everybody needs to be doing this throughout our work. And this of course is the mark of a work that is uh, going to be able to continue, whether it's spirituality or a company or whatever it is. And we had, we too, we have to participate in that. So do it consciously, I think, and uh, bring people up. I, I used to always say, and I still do, if in any position that you've been to uh, find yourself in work, just even a worldly sense, be thinking of who's going to take your job after you're there. If you're doing it, you know, and now some people say, oh my God, I don't want to, they might like, fire me hire the younger guy and pay him less. Well, <laughs> unfortunately, that sometimes is the case. But no, I think it's the duty of any good, any good manager, leader is always trying to mentor the next, the next person, take his place. It's actually what brings us freedom. 
we don't want to be stuck, you know, with the same old thing all, you know, forever. So we always take that attitude of always be looking for the next person to take your job and training them. And I think it's the sense of freedom comes with that. And I, I think it, it's for the health of whatever organization you're participating in to do that. So anyway, any. Uh Jai, I'm going to jump in there real quick on just a couple things and because there, there's nothing else yet in the chat and and I don't know Shiva was unmuted too. Shiva, did you was there something else you wanted to say or you still he was there and he was un, he unmuted himself but here he yeah, is. Yeah, you know, I get talking and I don't give other people a chance to ask questions verbally. So here <laughs> we are and I'm going to be quiet for a moment. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Jaya. <laughs> I, I hope you may recognize me, but... Uh, yes, uh, we have cross paths, I believe. <laughs> okay. Um, so the reverent attitude, uh, one follow-on question on that one. Um, the feeling of weakness. Um, how do we get not to um, get the feeling of weakness when we are admiring other people? Why do you... Th explain to me, why do you think that feeling comes in the first place? Um, because you may think when you admire something, you are admiring about good qualities and uh, obviously you don't have them uh -huh. Uh -huh. Right? and you want to aspire to uh, get them uh -huh. and, uh, the circumstances that probably, uh, will make you feel that it is probably not achievable or it is not something uh, easy for uh, the current circumstances, probably. I mean, that's my guess, but <laughs> I would like your view. Well, I think you're very right in the sense that that, uh, that feeling does come up sometimes. You know, it's like what Swami Sri Yukteswar is. Some people, but it's related. It's not a good quality, but it's, it's a natural human quality. Some people can only feel taller by cutting off the heads of others, you know, <laughs> and, uh, and so consequently, we find ourselves admiring something, giving reverence to something, and it reminds us of our own lack of whatever that quality might be. Like, let's say you meet a great soul and some people don't react well to meeting people of, who have great qualities because it reminds them of the lack of those very qualities in themselves. And I think this is very common. And of course, we know, I mean, intellectually, we know this is not the right thing to do. It's our, you know, but our ego is that way. We feel in our, it's the it's the reaction of the ego that feels threatened and it's a lack of self-confidence on the side of the ego's part uh, uh, because it's it, there's a certain threat there to it but if taken you no know, so you might say oh I don't want to feel that way well that I don't I wouldn't say that's the first thing that should come to mind it should be ah thank you I now see that quality in myself. Thank you. Uh, it's like when somebody criticizes you, you can react, oh, no, that's not true. Or you could say, hmm, maybe that is true. I'm going to do something. And I think it's the mark of the devotee and the person who has that essential quality to be successful on the spiritual path, absolutely essential is to be self honest. And so consequently, if we can take that feeling in the and the fact that you feel that is a good thing, because that means that you're sensitive to the quality and it gives you the opportunity to do something about it. You know, many people don't they have that quality, but they don't they don't recognize it as for what it is. And so the fact that you're recognizing it for what it is, is a, actually a good thing. But it's only good if you do something about it. <laughs> yeah, I can, compare, I can compare my own past with uh, what I feel now, right? Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Quite, so I, I never felt yeah. uh, that before. So yeah. now I feel that. So, yeah. You know, when I first met Swami Kriyananda, I felt a little of that. Because here was a man I, I ran into the fellow, the Swami was a genius. I mean, really, he was, he was, he was an art, he could, he was so artistic with, he was musically artistic. 
he could actually paint and he was painting artistic. He was a writer. He could write. He was art. I mean, he was just like, and, <laughs> and I aspired to want to be like that. But here was somebody, it was threatening to me. And it, it, I noticed the reaction would, when I first started to come into con, a little bit of a reaction. On the one hand, I admired it and I revered it, you may be. On the other hand, I guess it was a little bit of jealousy or, you know, or I, the tendency to want to pull other people down to your own level because it's threatening in some way. And I think my own sense of lack my own sense of inferiority because I couldn't do any of those things. And I felt bad about that, you know, because I wanted those things, but I couldn't, I didn't have it. So you want to, there's a tendency of the ego to want to pull those people down. And I thought that's, but you know, I, I came fortunately to realize that's a terrible quality to have, <laughs> but unfortunately it's exactly what Swami Sri Yukteswar said. You cut off the heads of other people to make yourself feel taller. And I thought, oh no, I don't want to do that. But I couldn't help but feel it. And you know, your it, my heart, my head says this isn't right. My heart says, well, here I am with that. And in time, what I found to do is I had this quality of reverence and showing appreciation. Show, you know, these kinds. I had to actively, and I re recommend this, actively stimulate those qualities of appreciation for other people, their talents, their, their good qualities, gratitude toward other people and what they do. And that, you know, be, in other words, do the opposite, you know, put out the positive energy, which is, I think is gratitude, appreciation, thankfulness, reverence. Uh, there's probably others we could think of if we all joined in here and thought of some of these. Do those and what it's going to do, it's going to combat that ego tendency to do the opposite. Because those are those are kind of a little bit ugly qualities to have, you know, dark qualities. And, we, none, and we don't. Yeah, their ego is what they are. And, and we don't like them, but they're there <laughs> or the potential is there. You see, not, not, they're not always there in everybody. But, you know, we're all a mix. We're in this relative world of duality of, of Maya. And it's a spectrum of absolute good, absolute bad, but there's no absolutes in the relative world. So the seeds of those negative qualities exist, even the most holy of people, as long as their consciousness still has a little ego in it. So we have to always be on the lookout for it. And so we have to do battle with those things. And I may think this is this is the Mahabharata Kurukshetra right there. <laughs> You're, well, the, some of those warriors were those of the of the Kurus were those qualities right there and they're in front of us and we have to do battle with them. And because uh, the, they may not be manifest so much, but they do exist as seeds of potential. So don't don't be um, we can't ever take it for granted that we're oh I've overcome that uh, because <laughs> then you're going to be in insure you know pride goeth before a fall is what they say <laughs> so anyway be careful of that but I think being vigilant on that is what you can do and you're being the fact that you recognize that is a positive thing you see because you recognize your enemy and that's the step you have to take to be victorious when you don't recognize your enemy that enemy sneaks up and <laughs> slays you <laughs> before you even know what hit you so the so actually it's a good thing i would take what you what you're saying is a good a good recognition of the battle you're fighting wonderful thank you so much okay okay good luck with it good luck to all of us <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Oh, yeah, I really, um, uh, there's so many things I've appreciated what you've said today and that whole idea of, of reverence and your whole thing of worship. You know, the worship is, is, is sort of a, has a dissonance to me I, too. It's like, I think it's because we all, well, many of us grew up with, you know. Yeah, the, it's the cultural, it's the cultural background. <laughs> it shouldn't, it shouldn't be there, but no. Here we are. We all have it to some degree. That reference is such a beautiful word, and it is just in. It's like just in repeating it, you can feel your heart soften and open, and 
and you know and then you can see how you can apply that in your life and, and then the other thing that really um I, I i it's been sort of a i go through these things of anthem themes you know it's like divine mothers like putting these thoughts in my head of just pay attention to this aspect of your spiritual life and in that whole aspect of really trying to see energy behind everything you know energy is the foundation of our of our path and the idea that we have to put out energy if we want to feel joy we've got to meet joy halfway and swami said that you know those kind of things many times that just putting out energy to be able to attract you know also what we're, we're seeking um it's not it's not passive at all um but anyway, I, I, I'll just share this one little thing. I've been very uh, in this reverent state the last few days because I'm, I'm now a beekeeper. And, <laughs> yeah, it's, you got all your little bees right in there. <laughs> all right, and that nectar and honey and all the different metaphors that go along with that. But uh, we had uh, a group of people over here last night, actually, because we cut down a tree that had a beehive in it that the owners no longer wanted there. We wanted to save the bees. It was a huge endeavor. But I'll tell you, it just opened my heart to so much reference for those beautiful little creatures. And uh, <laughs> I was thinking about, um, to this, the whole idea of nectar and honey and, and, and reverence is sort of like that nectar that you need to make the honey of that inner communion. So anyway, I, I was just really appreciative of your talk today. And well, well, take good care of them. You know, bees. It's a nice, it's a nice uh, image to think of. Yeah. Worker Amazing. bees. <laughs> so who else here? Um, we've got a few more people. Let's, let's see if we can hear from somebody that maybe hasn't spoken yet or chatted yet. Well, there... I, I'll just mention. Oh, hi, Jay. It's Mike. So nice to see you. Hi, my Mike. How are you? Wonderful, wonderful. Uh, my wife is uh, like a master naturalist gardener. So we have all the the, the native, that's it, native plants, uh, flora and fauna. And all of a sudden, there's just one little pile of uh, something growing. And there's like 12 of these caterpillars on it. And they're all growing. And then this this butterfly goes by me and it's like, you know, they're happy in this yard we've got because she, <laughs> she get, creates them a place where they can grow. And then <laughs> you see their little chrysalises, whatever it is. And then, th then the butterflies are running around there. They're so happy about us. <laughs> yeah, I think nature is one of the doorways that many people come to uh, a reverent state, you know, because it's God's creation and it's can be so beautiful, you know, that it just inspires that response. But then we have to be quiet because my wife and I have been walking. We got this park right next to us and we haven't been using it. But I was in this program where we're doing affirmation walks. I don't know if you ever heard of that. Yeah, yeah, so people, yeah. People pick an affirmation huh? and then the the person trying to coach them is saying ohm every five minutes. So, yeah. so my wife is not into ohm. So I just say, I'm going to say, okay, every five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> so we're walking through the park and we're quiet because she's, and I came up with my own affirmation and it's like, wow, it got us out into this park and we're just having the most wonderful time and we have to be quiet. And then, oh, it was six minutes instead of five minutes. I was supposed to say, okay. I said, oh, honey, I'm not doing my job. She said, oh, you just standing there. It's, that's all I need. You don't have to even say uh, it. Okay? Uh, I kind of, you know, I kind of do that a little bit myself. And I, I, don't, I don't say Om or OK. I, I say thank you. Ah, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> that's even better. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, I was singing the move all you mountains that stand in your way about overcoming obstacles. And then she came up with some affirmations she likes. And so anyway, we've yeah. had a good time with that. Oh, that's a good practice. Keep it up. <laughs> OK, nice to see you. Nice to see you, Mike. <laughs> Anybody else? Um, I see, see Mallory there and Missy. And I don't know, I don't have the whole thing up, so I can't oh, see if okay. anybody else has is is got their cameras open. But um, it is. 
getting it's 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 uh we're gonna be wrapping up here so if you anybody else wants to say anything there's there's alex up in minnesota he's our oh. farmer, farmer friend up in minnesota and i know i saw there's susan st Clair there and, and she's in fort collins and where where uh michael's gonna build you know the new pole star community and, oh. uh, which one was that? Did you mention? I was I was looking at Alex, and I, I was thinking of Alex as one of those, uh, you know, Garrison Keeler farmers up in Minnesota. You know that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, Norwegian That's, farmer. Saint <laughs> Clair is is uh, is the one is the. Uh, person. Oh hi, Susan Saint Clair. Yes, hello, hello. <laughs> Remember her? We've got a few people on from. Uh, uh, well, we had a few more that apparently dropped off, but Frank is in Austin. We have a very uh, robust Austin group, which Mark and I uh, visited last weekend and had a great time with yeah. those folks. Oh, my goodness. Really wonderful time. And, yeah, great people. Um, yeah. So, and Randy and Karen, these are all people of our, our Sangha here, so... But, you know, it's been wonderful to have you, Jaya. We, Thank you. Thank you for having me. Will you be heading back to India soon? Or? No, I'm, no, I'm not going to go back until uh, October. I'll go I'll be here until then. Okay. And is, is um, uh, Dave, are she still at Ananda Village? And no. It, it, yes, he is still at Ananda Village. He's, he is, uh, you know, a whole group. Uh, came back this year to renew their employment visa. In India, you get an employment visa, what we do. We're not tourists, we're not there. And I, I basically had mine, got mine done last year, but a whole bunch of them, you have to come back to the USA, country of origin, uh, after five years to renew it. And it, you know, the wheels of bureaucracy go slow in any situation. But during COVID, they really go slow. And so it's, you know, so we've had Diana, Devershi, uh, you know, I don't know if you know Darna. We got a whole bunch of people that are back in the USA uh, because of that very reason, Jamal, uh, to renew visas. And one by one, they're getting processed and they go back. Do you, do you know, uh, the reason I ask is uh, because typically we can't ask it's hard for us to ask some of our Indian uh, friends on because of the time change. And I wondered when I heard that there was a little bit of a backlog in that sense. Um, I wondered if, if uh, when those guys were leaving, because I was going to invite them on for satsang. No, no it's, that's, it's, it's not that bad. I guess you would be in India. You would be yeah. at in the evening. You would right now it would be late. You know, Oh, it'd be Sunday night. Yeah, it'd be a little bit Sunday. But you know, generally speaking, uh, people in India tend to be more evening oriented than morning oriented in terms of, you know, people stay up a little later. They eat, they eat their meals later. And so give it a try. I don't, you know, because I'm asked to do that all the time from India. And, you know, I just do it. And most every most in this world of online, all of us are trained. We're on we're on tap all the time, and it's Is not a big deal. Okay. <laughs> some, now some do. Now some not everybody will. Don't ask Diana to come on at midnight. But <laughs> but Jamal would. You know, I don't see why Jamal wouldn't do it. If you if you if you know if you yeah. know some of the indian uh, acharyas like i don't know if you know aditya or not he'd do it and uh so there are you know there are different ones that would okay well we'll, we'll look into that some more we we're uh you know some of us tune into the kriyavan uh sat song you were just on on tuesday and you gave such a wonderful talk i was like when when i was at the time when i was tuning into it i was thinking oh I'm going to bring up that point so he can talk some more about that on Sunday. And then, of course, I didn't write it down. And I just remember <laughs> a wonderful talk, but I don't remember the points I wanted to bring up. Well, but, I don't either. I can't remember. <laughs> I have no idea what I talked about. I yeah. can't remember. <laughs> yeah. we, we do keep in touch. We will have uh, uh, Shurjo and Narayani on in another month or so. Yeah. 
yeah, yeah. They have yeah. a dynamic thing happening there, it seems like, in, yeah. in yeah. Mumbai. Yeah. But Just put out feelers. They're you know people people are are usually pretty accommodating. So you know they they enjoy sharing. See in India, you know when you're in India, we think about serving worldwide uh, from there. I don't I don't this is I don't want to cast aspersions on Ananda in America, but. Uh, less so than America does, except for those who are in the online, you know, specific job. But in India, America's close in, in people's minds more than it is India's close in the American mind. So, you know, ask people, they'll be happy to, if, you know, at least ask them. Okay, and all, all their um, emails are Anandia, Ananda India, is that what it is? is it well, lots of them are, but there's all, it's all over the board. So okay. you can go on, go on to the email list and uh, on the Ananda library. I think many of them are there. Okay. All right. Well, it's been wonderful to share with you. Mm -hmm. Anybody, any last words, anybody? Otherwise, if you can, open your cameras and we'll wave goodbye. We, we, we tend to end with a, a unique uh, ending, I don't know if you remember, it's unique to Texas, and we'll do that in just a moment. Uh, I, you know, the what's that Texas song, the 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 something of Texas, uh, you know, the fight song? I don't know. Oh. The eyes of Texas. We don't the, eyes of, the, the eyes of Texas are upon you or something? <laughs> <laughs> Nothing quite that. Uh, no. Uh, um, it's just a, just a simple... Namaste, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> Namaste. Uh, thank you all for having me. You know, I'm I'm just real happy to have been here. <laughs> I'm, I'm hoping to come back again and see you all, y'all, another time. Thank you. That awfully well. <laughs> you do that very well. In fact, you sound so well that. I can we can bring you here in person. So we'll try to, to get you here again in person sometime in the in the future if you're willing. Uh, um, um. <laughs> um. Okay. Blessings to Sasad and Davy too. And okay. Everybody have a wonderful, blessed afternoon. Yeah, have a nice Sunday afternoon. Bye bye. Um, <laughs> namaste, y'all. <laughs> y'all.